Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to God's house on this wonderful Sunday morning. Good to see all, everyone here. Um, just really happy to be here at St. Paul's um, doing our service here. So wonderful that we get to talk about Jesus Christ here today. Because we've got a lot to talk about today. We've got to talk about His love. We can talk about His goodness and how we fit in all of that. We're going to hear in our service in our service today about a rich young man. This man thought he was good. He thought he was everything that it was good about being a Jewish man. How he was this is prodigal son almost. This great person. But how Jesus comes in, he has to ask the question, what is good? What is goodness? How are you, how can you be good? And we're talking about that today in our text this morning. But we have to start off in song. We have to start off and praising God the right way. So let's go open our hearts, let's open our eyes, and let's open our mouths as we sing our opening songs. Please stand for that. here. We are so excited to be in celebrating a place where God is with us and God is present 
in our time and in our place and in our minds. And there's a lot of stuff that we get to do as God's people and how we get to express that here at St. Paul's. There's a lot of stuff that's going to be happening and a lot of things that may be changing. Coming up here in the, near the middle of October, on October 18th, right here in the sanctuary, we're actually going to have an informational meeting. You may be saying, well, Pastor, what do we need to be informed about besides the Word of God? Well, we're going to be changing things, some stuff around here. There's some new people that are on the nominees to be elders for all of you to be your spiritual leaders in helping me in proclaiming the ministry. There's a lot of stuff going on that will be happening, though, with how we're going to be running things here at St. Paul, how we're changing our governance. And that is a lot of work, and a lot of people have poured a lot of time and their talents and their treasure into that. And so that information will be happening at 6 p.m. right here on Monday for that. And I hope you all would come because the following Sunday we have a voters meeting. We're voting on these people. We're voting on this new governance to help the ministry of St. Paul moving forward in all of that. We're also happy to know that there's going to be more stuff coming on because on November 7th, we're going to be having a walking through the Bible. I know this is something that you guys have heard, but it's so important because that we're going through the Old Testament on November 7th and seeing how God's love spans the entirety of that time period, how the promise of Jesus Christ goes throughout all of it. And we're going to be studying from the beginning of Genesis right until he comes. You might be saying, Pastor, how can we cover all the Old Testament in just three and a half hours? I haven't even covered it all in the past three and a half years. Well, guess what? We'll be learning some actions. We'll be learning some little shortcuts and how we can remember God's entire story of salvation and love in Jesus Christ. That'll be happening on November 7th at 1.30 to 3.00. 4.30, from 1 to 4.30, and we'll have that section up. Even for kids who are grades 1 to 5, they'll be in the gymnasium. They'll be learning exactly the same thing that we are all learning here, just slightly different, slightly a little bit um, easier for them to understand, but the same exact thing. So please join us on that time for that happening on November 7th. And you know, it's a good thing that we're doing all this because we have to be reminded that we are indeed sons of God and wonderful things. So we also have a reading for all of you from the Psalms. We have to remind all of this. Remind ourselves in the Psalm reading today from Psalm 90. So teach us to number our days that we gain a heart of wisdom. We return, O Lord, how long and have pity on your servants. But safe, satisfy us in the mornings with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. And made us, you made us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Remember establishing these wonderful works as we remember our tithes and our offerings. The work of our hands that we have given and the treasures that we have had given to our Father in heaven. And this is a wonderful thing that we get to do is partner with the ministries here at St. Paul's and the things that you give, the things that you do and the time that you give is so precious to God and we thank you guys for that each and every day. I want to remind ourselves though that we have this faith, we have this proclamation of love and confession. So let's now confess our words of our faith in the Apostles' Creed, we all say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we have proclaimed this great faith, and indeed it is our faith in Christ. That is our history that we have, that we get to say. The apostles said so long ago, they understood how important it was, but they also understood how important it was to recognize that we are sinful. We are not good. And no matter what we do, no matter how much we do, it will never be pleasing in God. We have sinned against God, either by our thoughts and what we think, 
by our words and what we say, and by our actions and what we do, and by the actions that we do not do. We are not good. But praise be to our Father who is good, because he promises that he listens to us, that he cares about us, and that he loves us. So let's come clean and go to God with our sins. Let's go to God and ask for his great forgiveness, which we have. sisters in Christ. It is my great pleasure to know that we have a God that loves and forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In this wonderful thing, we are forgiven. We stand as we sing our song. This is truly a wonderful thing to sing.
Y'all may be seated. At this time, we'd like to know that if there are any children here at Sunday school, it's time for Sunday school so we can go and ex see the Word of God and you can go have fun with that and learning about Jesus. You can go into the back and you can go on by. We'll see you here real soon. <laughs> so, I've got a question for all of you here, all of you either listening on home online. Does this phrase sound familiar to you? Actions speak louder than words. How many of y'all heard that before in your life? Yeah, exactly. And how true is it? I mean, you can say a thousand different words and they can have so many different meanings. You might sound like the greatest speechwriter in the world. I mean, I hate to say this, how many politicians do we know can speak really well? But what do we have them for? What do we hold them by? What they do? Their actions. And if your actions don't match your words, it's a problem. It's a big problem. Might we even say, though, that actions speak loud of the words, but your actions will also inform your words, and your words will inform your actions. You should do what you do and say what you say and mean it. That's the whole principle of what at least I try to live by. But also, there's the thing here. God wants that too. He wants your yes to be yes and your no to be no. He wants you to be truthful. He wants you to follow his word. And there's a lot of times in the Bible you can look back and you can see what happens when people don't follow his word. Or they praise God with their words, with their actions, that just doesn't back them up. A reading today from, came from Amos in our Old Testament reading. Amos was a prophet. He was a prophet to the people of Israel that weren't following God's command. And it certainly looked like they were, though. They were doing everything well, they thought. Their economy was booming back in Amos' day. They were doing so well that they were going and establishing walls outside their cities. They were expanding the kingdom. They took back lands that were stolen from them. They were building giant siege towers and towers where archers could be and defend their cities, not just in their city, but farther out, right over there where everyone could see them. And they were really happy about that. But Amos comes along and he says, you guys aren't doing too good. Your actions aren't matching your words. Because you're saying that you love God. You're saying that this is the year of the Lord's favor and you're giving praise to God. But what are you doing? You're taxing the people who don't need to be taxed. You want even more money from them that you're already taken from them. People who are poor, you're just forgetting. And there are people who are telling you to repent. They're at the gates and you're not listening to them. And their actions were speaking louder than their words. And what Amos said came true. A couple decades after Amos came along and he said all of this, that tribe of Israel was taken to Assyria. They were exiled there. But actions speak louder than words. That was God's actions, and they were speaking pretty, cl pretty clearly. God's words are, you shall be good. You shall follow my laws. You shall do the things I've commanded you. Take it to heart. Do them. And we should. Because God is a God of action. Because God's inherent goodness and love go hand in hand. And that is wonderful news for us here. Because when we think about ourselves as Christians living in today's world, we have to think about ourselves, are we good? Are we following God's laws? Are we good? How can our words meet our actions? How can our actions inform our words? Well, we're talking about here today. And there's no better gospel to talk about that than Mark. Because Mark is a book of action. Mark is a book where you can go into in the gospel and you can see Jesus' words matching his actions. Now, Mark is a very small gospel. You can actually listen to Mark. Not read it, listen to it. And it'll take you about 90 minutes. I used to say that was the same as a movie, but well, with movies, you know, two and a half hours is a normal Marvel movie these days, or even longer than that if you saw the end game. Well, then that's three hours long, and I promise you Mark won't take three hours to listen to. It's 90 minutes. But in those 90 minutes is jam-packed with action of Jesus preaching something, then he does it. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, the gospel is here, and I am right here. And guess what he does? He goes and he proclaims it. He goes and teaches it. But he shows it. He raises people from the dead. He walks on water. He cures illness and sickness. But there's always a purpose to it. There's always a purpose for Jesus doing this. Because on in Mark, Jesus is on a journey. He starts over here in the beginning of Mark, and he's over here, and he's preaching the law. He's preaching the gospel. And suddenly... He comes down and he's walking along in this journey. The journey always leads up somewhere. 
The journey leads to Jerusalem. There's always a point in time when Jesus goes and he begins his journey. Mark will say, and Jesus sets out on his journey. Because Jesus is setting out to Jerusalem. He's going up on that hill. And he's going there for a reason. He's going there to die. You have to remember that. Mark's entire gospel is a gospel of action, of Jesus' love and his goodness shown on the cross, and the entire time is a journey to that cross. We now are beginning here in our text today in the middle of this journey, near the end. And Jesus is walking along. He's setting up. Jesus is about to set out on his journey. And all of a sudden, a rich young man comes running by, and he lies face down, prostrate on himself, and completely cuts Jesus off on his path. Jesus is really walking down the path, and suddenly this young guy, out of the blue, comes up, runs up, smack dab in the middle of the road, and says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Pretty good question. First of all, you think this man he looks good, nice clothes, all a nice haircut. He was rich. Now that's another plus. Even more so, this rich young man seems like he's doing pretty good. He recognized Jesus as a good teacher, a rabbi. And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question. It's a godly question. I think Jesus would be, you know, happy about this. And Mark, his disciples, don't know what's going on. They don't even understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So you think this rich young man saying, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You think he's going to the good place. He's asking the good questions. Jesus says something very different, though. Jesus looks at this man who is prostrate on the road before him, showing him honor and reverence, and, and he looks at him and he says... Why do you call me good? Okay. It's not an answer. But you have to remember what good means. Back in that day, you only could call one thing good. It's not like today where you could say, oh, I had a really good salad, or I had a really good cup of coffee, or because it's October and it's Oktoberfest, you had a really good drink of beer. It's different than that. You can't call something good back in those days. And the good, you could call something tasted, you know, had a tasty meal. You have all these different other words, but the good that was used here was good, meaning perfect, meaning spotless, meaning something that is so good, it's set apart from everything else, that that is what's good. And so this rich young man was saying that Jesus was good. That means there was only one other thing that you could call good in that time. That was God himself. Only God is good. And the rich young man comes here and he says, good teacher, and the Lord says, why do you call me good? This rich young man hasn't appeared anywhere else in Mark. Probably heard of Jesus. Heard of his actions. Heard of his teachings. Only God is good. The rich young man is saying, good teacher, saying Jesus is good, set apart, holy. That's what he's saying. And Jesus has to remind, goes on from this, and he says, what are the commandments? Love your father, and honor your father and your mother. Do not kill, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not give false testimony. He lays out the second table of the commandments. God's law to love thy neighbor as thyself. Good laws to live by. He gave, God gave him his people that so that they could love each other, that they could follow in his way, so they would be set apart from the rest of the world to be good and follow after God. But this is Jesus we're talking about. It's not enough to be on the surface level. It's not enough just to do that. He goes back into Matthew. And in Matthew, he has some words to say in his Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. He says to them, if you pull it up here on the screen, now that I have them here, 
Here it is in Matthew 5. This is the Beatitudes, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He says, You have heard that it was said of those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Okay. Jesus, I'm with the ante here. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on and, the, and he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay. We're going even more. But he continues. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where the moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's important to know. Jesus is saying only God is good. Only God is good. He goes to the commandments, but even then, Jesus is saying, you have to keep these perfectly. It's not enough to keep the letter of the law. You have to keep the spirit of the law. You have to keep everything about the law. And that is the only way that you can say you are good. Now, how, who here has kept those perfectly? Raise your hand. Okay, good. You're not the rich young man. Because the rich young man hears all of this. And if he knows Jesus, he knows about the Sermon on the Mount. He knows what Jesus is saying here. And so the, sir, the man, so when, God, when Jesus says, only God is good, the rich young man says, and me too. I can do it. Lord, I know those commandments. I have kept all of them from my youth. Okay, now he's lying. Because I don't know anyone who's kept all those laws from his youth. Here's a rich young man who says he honors God, who loves God, who prostrates himself and interrupts Jesus' journey to declare him good, to proclaim that he wants eternal life. He's saying he is good. I've done it, Lord. I want it. Tell me how I can have it. Jesus gives him the answer. How can he have it? One thing you lack. Go. Sell all of your possessions and give them to the poor. Then come and follow me. Rich young man goes away. Very, very sad. Because he had a lot of possessions. And this is where we say, this is the war of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. But there's sadness there. Because a rich young man wasn't good. He wasn't perfect. Just like us. There's no better than him. We can't be good. No matter how hard we try. We can't love our God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind by ourselves. Because we ourselves are sinful. That's the way of it. And it's sad. God never wanted that for us. He never wanted us to not be good. He made us in his image to be good. That is what he always wanted. And yet, we can't be good. Because only God is good. And God, you know, set up these laws for us, his commandments, out of love for us. Not because he wanted to say, okay, you didn't follow these rules and I'm going to smite you now for it, but he made these rules, he made these laws because he loves us. Because he says, you are too important to me to go on and living in this sinful world. You are too important to me to let you go on sinning. Here are my laws so that you can follow, to be set apart, to be an example for others. And yet, we still can't. We are not good. We can speak with our words that we love God with all of our heart and our soul and all of our mind, but as soon as we go and we, you know, get mad and say some very mean things underneath our breaths to the person who just cuts, our, cuts us off on 30, or who goes and, you know, 
The Bears, unfortunately, throw another interception, and we yell so many profanities at the TV. <laughs> or when we lie to our spouses. When we give a false promise to our kids. When kids, you lie and cheat on a test. Maybe not even that much, you just forget to do an assignment. Maybe intentionally. It can even be something more. When we hate someone so much that we just don't want to go up to them and forgive them, that we want to hold on to our grudges, that we just don't want to be good because it's so hard, so much easier to not be good, to not have love. Well, God has an answer for that. You are not good. And there's only one judgment that can lead to that. Because you and I are not good, because you and I have sinned, we deserve only death. That's it. We were not meant to die, but because we are no longer good, because of Adam's sin in the garden, because of our continual sin, we can never be good. No matter how hard we try, everything just comes up empty. And we are destined to die. God never wanted that. He never wanted us to die. He did not create us to die. He created us to be good. He created us to be perfect. Just as he is perfect in heaven. But there's another part of the story. So Jesus asked the rich young man, have you kept all these laws? Only God is good. The rich, rich young man says, yes, I am good too, Lord. I'm perfect. What does Jesus do, though? When Jesus looks at the rich young man, he sa and he loves him. Then he gives the command to go and sell. But Jesus looks at this young man who says a blasphemy who utters a contemptible thing about God. And he loves him. Jesus loves him. That's the same for us. Because God loves us. He doesn't want us to die. But he knows that we are going to. And so he did the unthinkable. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I want you to understand what that means. It's something so radical and different because we were never meant to die. We were meant to live with God forever. There was only one man on earth who was destined to die. Only one man who was born of woman who was created with the exact purpose to die. And that was Jesus. The only person in all of existence that God said, your purpose is to die. And it wasn't because Jesus was evil. It's because he was good. Jesus was good. Jesus is good. But he wasn't good for his own sake. He was good for us. He was perfect. And because he was perfect, and because he was true God. He could keep all of God's laws, but he was true man because only man could pay for man's sins. And only God could do it and be perfect. And so, perfect God and perfect man came to this world, and he loves us. And he loves us so much that he went to a cross. And he who was perfect and good became sin. He became everything bad and evil and rotten in this world. He took everything that was pure, putrid on himself. And on the cross, he said the words, it is finished. And in his action, died. And those words became a reality because on the cross, Jesus Christ, perfectly good, took upon himself the sins of the world, my sin, your sin, everyone's sin, forever and more. 
and those sins died with him because he loves us. God loved us so much that he didn't want us wallowing in sin anymore and so sent his only beloved son to die for the sins of the whole world because he looked at us and he loved us. But even more than that, he loved us so much that he wasn't just content on sins dying. He loved us so much that he raised his son to life. And now whoever looks upon Jesus, who believes in Jesus, has eternal life. Because God loves us so much, he didn't want us to die anymore. That he gave us this wonderful faith and this wonderful proclamation that anyone who dies in Christ lives in Christ that we will be raised up on the last day, that we will celebrate the eternity with God's love, that we can go into the place where we never have to worry about sin and death, where God looks at us and says, you are good. Not because you keep all the commandments, not because you're doing all these good things. You are good because you washed yourself in the blood of my son. My son covered you with his blood. We had a baptism this morning at 8 o'clock, and it was beautiful because that is the purest expression of God's love. How a young little baby was baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the washing away of her sins and given the Holy Spirit because God loves us so much that he comes and he lives within us. That he dwells within us so that we can do the good works that God has prepared for us. That he strengthens us to do those good works, not for him, and not because we are perfect, but because God wants us to do good things for our neighbor, that he loves us so much that he gives us work to do. That he gives us a responsibility to love people and gives us ways to do that. Whether to go up to someone and be kind to them, whether that be kind to your parents or teachers or anyone, whether that's to go to someone and say to them, hey, do you know that you're loved? There you love so much that God didn't want you to die, but sent his son to die for you. Not because of what you did, but because he loved you so much. That is what we have. That is God's goodness and love to us. We can't keep it in. Because we are good now. Not because of us, but because of God. We are declared righteous because of Christ living within us. And his righteousness shines forth from us. So that the works that we do do not praise ourselves, but praise God who is in heaven. So that the love that we share is a love that God shares to each other on this earth. That we get to be God's love made real on this earth to love others. And that is what is truly good, right, and salutary. That we should praise God at all times for his love that sustains us each and every day into life everlasting in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to have a, cl- a little quick prayer if you would join me with that prayer. We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, You have given us so much love that you sent your son into this world. That you love us so much that you raised him from the dead and gave us life eternal. That you loved us so much that we have the opportunity to share that love with others. Let that love guide our hearts and our minds. Let that love drive us forth to proclaim your praises. And let that love live within us. And let your goodness live within us so that we may walk in the ways that you have prepared for us. We ask this all through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we continue to pray. Dear Lord, we ask you to watch over and close your sister from here in the house. And we ask you to bless the Lord and bless the Lord and bless the Lord and bless Church family, we, we pray. We pray 
the prayer that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, please stand up and join us in the scene. <laughs> better, better is one day in your courts than a thousand. Receive the benediction and blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you all his peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.